everybody, if I could ask you to take a seat, and hopefully there are enough seats for folks. There's a couple of chairs over here on the side. There's some in the middle over here, a couple in the middle over here. Um, we would like to get settled down and get started. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Brenda Gayden. Um, some of you in the room do know me. I work for the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission, BCDC. Um, we regulate dredgings, piers, houses, everything in San Francisco Bay. I am not here in that capacity tonight. This is not my jurisdiction. I'm here simply because I'm interested in the California coast. I am interested in what's happening in Pacifica. I work on sediment issues in San Francisco Bay, and since we are all connected by the water and the sediment along the coast, I'm very interested in what's happening in your community as well as my own. I wanted to um, thank everybody for coming. Um, this is an amazing turnout. When I go to town council meetings in my own community, San Rafael, there is maybe a third of what we have here tonight. So I'm very proud of you all for showing up and being good community members. So yeah, give yourself a hand. Um, so I'm here to facilitate tonight. So the idea is, is there's probably, I'm guessing, over 100 people here, maybe close to 150, I haven't counted, but really good turnout. We have some really great speakers with some expertise on uh, geology, on um, coastal process issues, county issues. Um, and so we are gonna have a really good evening that's gonna be very educational. Um, and we wanna make sure that our speakers have an opportunity to be heard. We also wanna hear from the community, but there are so many of you, it's gonna be a little challenging to do. So what we've done, and this is a typical way of trying to make sure people have the opportunity to provide questions and comments, is to put uh, question cards on your chairs. Um, and so if you have a question or a comment that you would like to provide while the speakers are speaking, go ahead and write it down. Um, please, good handwriting, because if you can't read it, it's gonna be hard to read it back to you guys. Um, I turned 50 just the other day. So here are my reading glasses, okay? Um, so please um, don't make it so hard on me to read, because my one of my jobs is to read back the comments um, and questions from you all so that our speakers can address them. It's a little bit easier when we have a really big crowd to do that. So um, I have a couple of ground rules over here that I just want to quickly go through. We are starting on time. We've already accomplished number one, good job. We do want to end on time because I know everybody would like to get a good night's sleep. Um, so we're going to try to stay very much on agenda and the speakers are going to have a challenge doing that because they have a few minutes each to get their ideas and thoughts across. I already mentioned the cards that you have. There are also, at any time, if you want to get up and write something on one of the comment walls, put a post-it up, you're welcome to do that during the meeting as well. I put down share the floor. Basically, it's going to be this group of people talking, me trying to get out your questions so they can answer them. The group is not gonna be standing up and talking. We simply don't have enough time for that. But it is important that if you have questions that you put them out there and that everybody, as many, many of the questions as we can get through, we will. So we really do wanna share the floor, even in the written comments, because if you put out 10 and someone else only puts out one, it's not a very good sharing ratio. Um, and then the last thing I'd like to just ask everybody is, is that we listen with an open mind. We don't always agree with everything we've heard, but it's good to open your mind and see if you can understand, learn, listen, um, and think critically about what you're hearing. And ask good questions, right? Because that's what it's all about, a good exchange. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Don Horsley for a quick moment. Oh, no, I'm giving it to Sue. Hi. <laughs> And thank you, everybody. It is really a great turnout tonight. It's wonderful to see everyone here. I'm Cindy Abbott, and I am currently have the honor of being the president of Pacifica's environmental family. And PEF has been part of the Pacifica community for over 25 years, 
A lot of you know some of our projects, such as the Pacifica Beach Coalition, which are much more visible, but we act behind the scenes as their fiscal sponsor. And tonight we're doing what really comes back to the roots of the organization, which is providing environmental education for the community. And we're delighted that so many are here tonight. We posted film screenings when it comes to be time for city council races. We do candidates forums. And we'd also like to thank, and we'll have up in a minute, our friends from the Pacifica Climate Committee who are um, helping us with the logistics for the evening. I'd also like to acknowledge, and she doesn't know, and I can't sing her, Margaret Goodale, who really had this idea and ran with it. She was able to attend the... Um, A forum was held at the end of January over at Genentech, and at that time, uh, Margaret went, she met up with Hillary, and we were able to coordinate to bring this program here to Pacifica today with a focus on our specific issues. And over the past many months, we know that Pacifica has made not only the no local news, but we're visible in the state, we're visible nationally, and also internationally. Not really for the reason that we want to be, but um, we are. We're making the news everywhere with what's been taking place. How many of you have had friends and family reaching out to you saying, are you okay? What's going on? Is everything okay? How's your house? So um, it's, you know, it's very personal and people all over the, really the world are aware of what's happening here. And not only do we have the sinkholes going on and the cliffs eroding, but we also have things going on with our beaches. So many of us spend time walking down at the beaches. And if you go to Shark Park, for instance, where I live, you'll see the sand completely shifting and completely changing the face of what the beach has historically looked like. And so that's part of the conversation today. We're going to be talking about some of our signs are about property values and different things that are important to us. But our beaches are really one of our most important assets in Pacifica. And we want to make sure that we're doing everything to protect it as well. Um, dealing with sea level rise, as we're going to hear about, is really complicated. And looking back at some of the historic actions or means to prevent erosion might have had in unintended consequences. And actually, sometimes some of the things we used to do have made the situation worse. We'll probably hear about some of that tonight. The City and County Association of Governments has recently formed a subcommittee um, to look at the mechanisms of sea level rise, stormwater, and flood control, because all of these things are related and part of what needs to be involved in this conversation. That's a new group that's called the Water Committee, and it's actually chaired by um, Pacifica Council member Marianne Nyhart, with Supervisor Dave Pine as the vice chair. And in a moment, we'll hear from Supervisor Don Horsley, who's been actively involved in this conversation and making sure that the coast side is part of that conversation for the past several years. So as the city and county and all of the partnering agencies contemplate the future of Pacifica and sea level rise, we wanted to take this opportunity to share important data with the public because it's with this information that we're going to be able to ask questions and see that informed decisions are made. So that's what tonight is all about, making sure that we have information and facts and comments and questions that we receive both on the cards, the things that are being posted on the walls. We're going to be scheduling a meeting with the um, city manager and staff and city council, and we'll be passing all of that information on to them. And we look forward to, based on what we hear tonight, coming back and doing more forums and expanding on the topics that are of interest of you. Um, enough for me, though the one note, if you do need the restroom, it's right across the hallway. That's really important. And um, I would, though, now like to turn it over to Sue DeGree. Or, excuse me, I'm, I'm, boy, we're all messed up. I'm turning it over to our partner, or to Don Horsley, who has, um, has come here tonight but needs to be someplace else. I, I hope after you don't want me to be someplace else. But I actually, I have a bike and ped committee that I have to be in. So, uh, so thanks for letting me speak first. Uh, I don't want to take a lot of time, but as uh, Cindy was saying, there is a water committee. Both Dave Pine and myself are on it, as well as your former mayor, uh, Marianne Nyhart. And we are looking at flood, sea level rise. We know on the bay side, we've got uh, major problems with, we have a series of creeks that are flooding. So all of the things that we hear about sea level rise, 
are happening now. They're happening. San Mateo County is one of the counties that is probably most affected in the entire state of California. So we're really going to need to have a lot of help from not just from the county and the cities, but also from the federal government and state government as well. The economy of California, actually, there's an interesting <laughs> statistic. The 101 corridor, 280 corridor, and that means from Santa Clara all the way to San Francisco, provides 25% of the entire revenue for the state of California. So it kind of, when you, know, when you hear about you know, the national economy, a lot of it's really coming out of San Mateo County, Santa Clara County, San Francisco. The last four years, we created 55,000 jobs. So if, if you sometimes feel like you're crowded over here with traffic, you are, because the fact of the matter is that we've created so many jobs, there's, it's, uh, it's just astounding. And it, the other thing about, you live, and we should all be thankful, we all, I think we all are, you live in one of the most beautiful areas of the state of California, and unfortunately, all seven million people in the Bay Area want to come here on the weekend. So, uh, but in any case, I was talking to a gentleman about uh, do what do I think about uh, sea level rise and you know king tides? Should we do manage retreat? Well, that's a public policy decision, frankly, that we have yet to figure out. I know the Coastal Commission has weighed in on it, and a county will have to make those decisions, and cities will have to make those decisions. But we're not going to be able to make it. We're not going to make it in a vacuum. We need to know what our citizens think. And so it's really important for you to participate. You get as much knowledge as possible. Help us make uh, some good public policy decisions for all of us for the future. So I have to say, one of the things I love about the Coastside, we all have opinions. And everybody, and you really, really uh, show up. Uh, other communities do not. So all of the seminars that Day Pine uh, has held, and with uh, other members of the board, the coast side is always well represented. Some of the other cities are not. So I really congratulate you for your civic activism. Activism is incredibly important. And I want to also uh, point out that Hillary Papadick is our staff person, a climate action specialist. Be nice to her. She's not feeling well. She's got a bad cold. So um, in any case, thanks for coming, Hillary. And thank you. Hello, I'm, I'm Carlos Davidson with the Pacifica Climate Committee. I'm just going to take a couple minutes here. Um, first, I wanted to, the Climate Committee is a co-sponsor of this event. It is a citizens group here in town working on climate change issues affecting Pacifica. Um, if, you, if we get a break or you have some time at the end, we have a table back there. Come sign up on our mailing list if you want to get announcements from us or talk to us about things that we're doing. We worked on getting the city to commit to the mayor's uh, climate commitment. Um, we successfully pushed the city to set up a task force to draft a climate action plan um, and a whole host of other uh, ac activities. Um, hopefully you'll come away from this event tonight wanting to do something about climate change and something about sea level rise. Um, what we should be doing is what communities and states and countries all around the world are doing. We need to plan for sea level rise. It's coming. We need, we need to, all kinds of different aspects of planning. And we need to work on reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Both adaptation, dealing with sea level rise, mitigation, reducing emissions. Kind of globally, if we don't reduce emissions, we can't get out of the, the problems that we face just through adaptation. We need both. Um, and you may say, well, Pacific is a small town. Um, our admissions are small relative to a, to a big city. We don't have a lot of resources. Why should we be working on reducing admissions? There's a bunch of answers to that, but a, a short one that I'll give that relates to what we're doing tonight is that when we need help, and we will need help from the state, from the county, from the federal government for dealing with sea level rise, we have to also be working to help those entities deal with their greenhouse gas emission reduction commitments. The state of California has some of the best climate legislation in the country. It's working hard to reduce statewide emissions we need to do our part, particularly since we are going to be turning around and saying, help us out with sea level rise. Um, in the city here, we have a very good climate action plan. Um, unfortunately, we are not implementing it. 
that climate action plan is just mostly sitting on the shelf. So I hope um, out of this event that we will get energized to push the city to do sea level rise planning um, and adaptation. And I also hope that we will ask, implement the climate action plan. We, we need both those things. So thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce our mayor, Sue DeGree. It's, it's always a pleasure and an honor to be with Pacificans. I'm very grateful for your activism and your creative thinking. As an educator, I love these kind of events. The more, the better. I know there are people uh, in Pacifica who would love to be here who can't, and we're so fortunate to have PCT, so this is, can be rerun. And uh, I know Margaret instigated, we have held the forum in 2009, I think we did. We also had a really good turnout then, it was sea level rising. So we've been on this case for some time, and the ocean, uh, we do need to listen to the ocean. One, one size does not fit all, and I'm very happy that we have a regional presence here. It's not just Pacificans, but other, maybe even some San Franciscans, and I certainly know that south of the tunnel folks are here and, and welcome. So I think we'll hear a lot, I'm hoping, that what is the ocean telling us? And, uh, and you're all eager, and what another thing tonight I'm noticing is that we have all age levels, except maybe three-year-olds. So. I really applaud you and thank you very much for being here and I applaud those who are putting this on because you care and your history with this subject matter is long and enduring and I really appreciate that. questions, <clears throat> say you've written one and you'd like us to have it, and it's actually better for us to have them before the very end because these two lovely ladies here are doing the yeoman's work of sorting out and trying to clump together questions that are similar. So they're, they're going to be working as they're talking. We'll pick up cards. We'll give them to them. They will sort them out. Because there are so many people and we're anticipating a lot of questions and we have a lot of time for questions, um, we may need to say there's three that are very similar, and we may pick you know, the most encompassing of the three, so you may not hear your exact words, but the idea is, is that we will hear the question in general and get it answered to the best of our panelists' ability. Um, okay, I have a quick little exercise. I just wanna see how many people live really close to the beach where you feel vulnerable from the ocean. Can you just raise your hand? Okay. So it's important to acknowledge that there are people who are here who are vulnerable, okay? It's important to acknowledge that. Uh, it's another thing to Im important to acknowledge how many people in this room love living near the ocean, love to go to the beach. Pretty much everybody, right? So, so right off, we know that we have some people who are vulnerable who also care very, very much about the beach, and we have a lot of people here who care about the beach and being close to it. I live 45 minutes from the beach, I don't get to have the same experience as you guys. It takes me a while to get there. But when I come down here, I love it. I also want to acknowledge something about human nature. So we live, if we're lucky, 80, 90 years, maybe 100, and an uncle lived 106, great. But in our lifetime, we a lot of times begin to think that the world is static, right? That what is there today will be there tomorrow. And that's kind of the way we are as beings. And a lot of animals are that way. They kind of count on the rain to come at a certain time, the mountain to be there, the beach to be there. But we are living in a time of very, very dynamic change. And a dynamic change that's been pretty unprecedented in human history, really. And so there are people who are working hard trying to figure out what the answer is to the people who are immediately affected, to the people who will be affected in 20 or 30 years to have to slow down the effect altogether. And honestly, and I work on this stuff a lot, there is no one really good answer, and we don't actually know the answer yet. We're still all scratching our heads and trying to figure it out. And so it is important to remember that as we work on these very, very challenging issues in an unprecedented time with vulnerable people who also still love the ocean, even though it's a challenge to us and scary to us at times, they're all into this together. 
we have lots to learn from each other, and somebody maybe has a great idea. So we remember we're a community, we're here to work on this together, and we don't know the answer yet, so we need to keep talking and learning. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our speakers. And our first speaker is not me. It is um, Hillary from the San Mateo Office of Sustainability. And Hillary, I don't know if you'd like to sit or stand, but can everybody see Hillary? Yeah, you might want to. You might want to stand, just so people can see you. And we'll be wandering around picking up cards while she's talking. Okay, great. Well, can everybody hear me? Okay. As Supervisor um, Horsley mentioned, I am getting over a cold, so hopefully my voice comes through okay. Um, I'm going to talk twice this evening. First, I'm going to give an overview of sea level rise and what that could mean for Pacifica and San Mateo County. And then I will get back up and talk about the San Mateo County's efforts to work on a sea level rise vulnerability assessment and our efforts to prepare for sea level rise. Um, so um, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm very impressed with the turnout. And um, I will go ahead and um, feel free to drop the questions along as they, as they come up. Um, so first, why is sea level rising? There's two main reasons. Um, the ocean waters are getting warmer. So we know that the temperature is increasing globally. And as the temperature increases, oceans warm. And as they warm, they literally expand. So this is one reason why sea levels are rising. And then the other reason is that there is um, fresh water entering oceans as um, it melts from land-based ice sheets and glaciers. So as it gets warmer, those land-based ice sheets and glaciers melt, and that adds water to the oceans as well. So those are the, the main sources of, um, uh, main causes of sea level, sea level rise. So how much have seas risen? And it's in the last centuries, um, so from around 1900, sea levels have risen eight inches. Um, according to the San Francisco type gauge. And this is a graphic from the Coastal Commission Sea Level Rise Guidance, and this shows the data from the tide gauge. So the San Francisco tide gauge is the longest existing tide gauge in the country. It has data that goes back to about 1865. And you can see here that sea level um, at that tide gauge is not constant. So there are these red spikes, and those are the spikes from El Nino's, and, and the, the blues are during La Nina years. So the sea level has been variable, but the trend has been eight inches in the past um, 100 years. So how much do we, can we expect sea levels to rise in the future? Um, and this amount will vary depending on where we are because um, it depends on the, the local conditions and how much land is sinking or rising. Um, but there are the global projections, and then those projections have been tailored down to California. And right now, the best available sea level rise projections for California are from the National Research Council report, and this came out in 2012. And so these give ranges. So by 2030, um, we can have two inches to a foot of sea level rise. By 2050, half a foot to two feet of sea level rise. And then by the end of the century, we could see one foot to five and a half feet. Um, so those are huge ranges. And the reason why we have such large ranges is we don't know how much, as a society, we're gonna be able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so that, that's why one of the key things that we all can work on is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And that means we can end up at a lower end of these ranges. Uh, we also don't know the dynamics of future ice sheet melt. Um, so those, that also is a large cause of some of the uncertainty. As you, you go out to 2100, the, the range is wider because the uncertainty grows as well. Um, but I was reading um, a couple nights ago that if we, um, based on right now, the current emissions that we have emitted into the atmosphere, if we don't account for any future ice sheet melt, we've committed ourselves to 11 inches of sea level rise. So we at least know that, and that doesn't account the future ice sheet melt. So um, that's why it's important to start preparing because we've already um, committed ourselves to a certain amount of sea level rise. So um, when we look at, at sea level rise and, um, and looking at what the impacts are, we need to look at the water level, um, total water levels, and all of the different, com different components that go into water levels. So here, I, this, this graphic is from NOAA, from some graphics they put together on king tide flooding. So you can see that there are daily tides. So as everyone who lives near the ocean knows that the, the um, 
the tides are changing and, um, twice a day. And then you have king tides, which happen um, in the winter and also in the summer, but at night, so we don't see them as much. So you have extreme tides that happen a couple times a year. And then you have El Nino on top of that, which can elevate water levels based on um, the warmer waters and then vast have effect with water shifting over to, to our side. Um, and then on top of that, we have coastal storms, which can elevate water levels as well. And then, oops, that's the wrong one. Um, And then on top of that, we have sea level rise. Um, so, um, so that was the, a very quick background of sea level rise. Next, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know what kind of impacts could we see in the um, here in Pacifica and in the county. So, this is an image from the Our Coaster Future Sea Level Rise Modeling Tool, which is a publicly available tool. It was developed by USGS. And I will use three feet of sea level rise with, uh, with the big storm, and you can see um, some of the areas that could be, be inundated. You can go to this site and play around with all the different amounts and, and take a look at you know, what some of those tipping points are for um, when things get to be flooded. And you can look with storms and without storms. So um, what are some of the impacts of sea level rise? As waters rise, we will have more erosion. There'll be more wave force to cut away at bluff edges. Um, we can have permanent inundation. So some areas that are currently flooded now at a high tide could become flooded every single day if we have an extra foot of water that's there permanently. Also, we could see temporary flooding. So then water's just going in and temporary flooding things with the, with the tide. And then saltwater intrusion is another thing. Um, so saltwater will, will, as the seas rise, so will groundwater tables. So um, I'm sure some of you may have seen the study that came out last week um, by her et al. I'm not sure if I'm saying his last name right, in, in Nature. And so this is the study that's looking at you know, where sea level rise projections are 50 to 100 years out. And, and the past estimates have shown how many people are at risk 100 years out. But they haven't looked at population growth at the same time. So when you, you account for the population growing um, and the um, in, in sea level rise, what the study found that um, it actually San Mateo County is one of the most at risk counties in the nation. There are five counties in the nation that have 100,000 people at risk from three feet of sea level rise by 2100. Um, so we're definitely right up there, you know, having a bay and a coast really um, makes us quite a vulnerable county. Um, so that, there are a lot of headlines on this that you, I'm sure many of you may have seen that report that came out. So, so a little bit about what sea level rise could, um, you know, some of the impacts that, that we could see. A lot of these are what we're already seeing today. Um, so we live um, in a dynamic landscape and um, we already are experiencing flooding from, from storms and so forth, but sea level rise could make that a, a more frequent occurrence. So transportation networks, we have communities living in low-lying areas. This is from the, from the bay side. Um, and then our bluff top communities, as you know, are currently eroding. And this, this erosion is something that's been going on for a long time, um, you know, based on sediment supplies and lack of sediment coming in. Um, so this erosion that we're seeing is based on El Nino and the big waves that we've been seeing this winter. Um, so um, with sea level rise, it's even more erosion. And then we have wastewater treatment facilities. Joshua Cosgrove is going to talk more about uh, Pacifica's wastewater treatment facilities. Um, I just circled a pump station here at Lindemar. And then, as we all know, the Bay Area's economic engine is located in a low-lying area. Um, and the, I just think it's important to notice the connection between what we have on the Bay side that's at risk and the coast side. And both people living on the Bay and the coast depend on both, on both sides of the infrastructure. Um, and our public access, beaches, par uh, public walkways, and so forth, and then wetlands also. Um, if wetlands can't move inland um, they, it, um, they keep pace with rising sea levels, then they could be converted to open water. And wetlands provide really valuable flood protection benefits as well as habitat benefits. Um, so great, that's, that's what I had for an overview. And um, I will pass it along, I guess back to Brenda. Yes, um, okay, thank you very much, Hillary. Next we have, Carla Grandy from Skyland College. And Carla is a professor there, and she's gonna to talk to us a little bit about the geology of the area. Um, so hang tight. 
Here we go, Carla. Okay, so thank you all for being here and thank you for having me. Um, yes, I'm a professor of geology and oceanography and at Skyline College, which is just down the road, and this is actually the view of Pacifica from Skyline College, so you can see it from our perspective. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about, uh, the, the science behind it, so the oceanographic and geologic processes that are happening here. And we're in an interesting place because this is where the atmosphere, the ocean, the land all come together, and it's a very dynamic place, more dynamic than, than some other places, and that has to do with both the oceanography and with the geology. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, Okay, so I want to start out with the wave climate, and um, what you can see here, so orient yourselves, um, the, what you're looking at is, can I come around there? Okay, sorry, I'm used to being able to, to point. Um, so what we're looking at here, you can see these darker colors up here, and we're looking at wave height in feet. So in the Pacific, we have really big waves just on a normal basis, and, and that has to do with the size of the Pacific Ocean. It's really large, and so there's a large area for, for waves to develop. And so if you compare it with other places in the Northern Hemisphere, we have larger waves, and that's just under normal conditions. Um, most of our big winter waves come from the Northwest, so they form up off of the coast of Alaska, and then they travel Northwest. And so when they hit our coastline, they're usually coming in at an angle. And so that sediment gets moved from north to south along the coastline. Um, and that's, that's our normal situation. So, yeah. OK. And so then when you put on top of that El Nino, um, it makes things even more exciting. So you guys are all familiar with El Nino. You've been living El Nino. And you know that it lasts for 18 months or so. It happens every two to eight years. And so what we're looking at up here on the top are the El Nino events, and on the bottom, the blue, are La Nina events. And so you can see, going back from 1950 to uh, today, that it oscillates between the two. And so it turns out that there's a, another cycle going on there as well, which is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And so we have these decadal periods of mostly El Nino events or mostly La Nina events. So if you look back to this period between about 1950 and about 1977, uh, we had mostly La Nina events. And so you guys know that that's when it's, it's pretty calm um, climatically around here. And that's when most of the California coast was developed. And then beginning in about 1977, to 1997, we had more El Nino type weather. Um, and then we've had a little bit of a calm period and drought, and now we're having more of an El Nino type event. So we oscillate between those two, and that's, that's the normal circulation patterns. So um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about this because you guys are probably familiar with it, but I just wanna point out that when we talk about El Nino, we're talking about the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is the oscillation between pressure, temperature, circulation patterns on either side of the Pacific. So with an El Nino, we tend to get more rain. And the other big piece of that, what I'm going to focus on more, is that as normally the winds are pushing the warm water to the eastern side of the Pacific, um, sorry, the western side of the Pacific, during an El Nino, that water sloshes back. And so we have this warm pool of water that develops off of our coastline. And it's not a lot warmer, we'll look at that in a second, but ordinarily it would be over here off the coast of Australia and Indonesia. But during an El Nino, it sloshes back and it hits the coast of Peru and then it spreads north and south. And that's one of the main things that makes, uh, makes things so geologically exciting during an El Nino event. So this is just showing you sea surface elevation, but we'll look at that on the next one. So here is the sea surface temperature anomaly from the current El Nino. And we're looking at degrees in Fahrenheit. So in the middle is zero, 
the dark red is five degrees Fahrenheit. So the area around um, Pacifica and the central coast seems to be, as of March, about three and a half degrees or so warmer than normal. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it has several kind of secondary effects that it creates. So let's talk about those. Um, the first one Hillary talked about, which is the elevated sea surface. So as water gets heated up, it expands, density decreases, and it takes up more space. So not even that there's more water there, just that it's taking up more space, and so you have elevated sea levels. Um, and so what we're seeing here is relative sea level from 1880 to 2000. You can see one that it's just increasing steadily over time, but all of those spikes are during El Nino events. And if we look at the current El Nino event, we're looking at um, millimeters. And so the red, it's very hard to read, but the red is about 12 millimeters. So you can get a sense of, of where we are just from that raised sea level. So that's one thing in and of itself, it means we have higher sea levels. But then when you add on top of that, the increased wave activity, which comes with El Ninos. During El Nino, we expect the wave energy to increase by about 20%. So all of those big winter waves um, come in that much higher. And so that means there's a much greater risk for erosion. The other piece of that is increased precipitation. With El Ninos in California, we get more rain. And so what I'll talk about here in a second is two different ways that coastal erosion happens. One is from the waves and one is from the increased precipitation. So there's the oceanographic and atmospheric side of coastal erosion. And then the other side of coastal erosion is the geology. So this is a geologic map of Pacifica. And all these little green bits are Franciscan rocks. Those are older rocks. Um, they were oceanic crust that got uplifted during subduction. And so they're hard rock. And so if you look along the coast, the little green bits stick out. And that means that they're more resistant to erosion. Yeah. And then a couple down here. But the majority of the coastline is yellow. And those are very young marine sediments. So these light yellow are quaternary sands. So they were formed during the Holocene, which means that they're 10,000 years old or less. And that sounds old to us, but in geologic terms, that's like yesterday. So very, very young and loose, medium to coarse grained dune sands and beach sands. Okay, so um, we'll look at some pictures here in a second, but there's, they're very loosely consolidated. It's barely even rock. It's mostly just sediment. So that's most of the coastline. There's a couple other units. Um, there's a Pleistocene one, which is a little bit older, but still poorly consolidated. And then there's another Holocene, unconsolidated fine uh, silt and sand. So that's the majority of the coast, is this really loose sediment. And you guys know that. Um, so let's look at this one because there's, that's what the majority of it is. So this is that famous picture from the drone. Um, and you can see it's just crumbling away. Um, it's not even breaking off in chunks because it's, it's not that consolidated. It is loose sediment and falling down. Let's zoom into that for a second. Um, so what we're seeing here mostly is the erosion from the top. So we're seeing the bluff failing from the top rather than from the bottom. Um, and that's, that's something to keep in mind. So um, when we have these two things coming together, these El Nino-induced storms that come with increased water levels, um, and then we combine that with this really unconsolidated, weak sedimentary rocks, then that leads to coastal erosion. So there's two different pieces of this. Um, and one of them is the wave erosion. And there was a paper that was published by somebody at the USGS in 2007 that looked at um, a LIDAR study of the cliff faces, and they found that in the northern part of the coast, most of the erosion was happening from wave activity. So waves coming in at the base of the cliff, breaking on the base of the cliff and undercutting it from the bottom. And that was with the, the least consolidated sediments. 
Then in the southern part of the city, um, there's more erosion from the top. And so that's happening from precipitation. And particularly with these El Nino type storms, the sediments get really saturated and become really heavy, and that's when they fail. So there's two different pieces going on, depending on which type of rock you're looking at. Let's see. So a few things that have been used around here, which you guys are familiar with, um, in terms of trying to slow coastal retreat, um, riprap, revetments, so placing rocks at the base of the cliff, um, seawalls, and then gunite or hardening of the, the cliff from above. And the problem with all of these is just that the, the cliff face is so soft. Um, you can see here that 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 gunite wall is just failing along with the rest of it. Um, and when we're talking about erosion that's happening from the top, if you don't have the whole thing, um, the whole thing hardened, it's not going to protect the top. So that's really one of the major challenges here is the geology and how can you how can you strengthen that rock which is just fundamentally very soft. So. Um, one other thing that I want to point out, just in terms of the beaches as a resource, the main sources of sand to the beach are the rivers and streams that are in the area, um, which that's an episodic source, it only, the sediment only comes when it rains a lot. And then the other one is sea cliff erosion. So again, when you're walling the sea cliffs, then you're cutting off that source of beach sand, um, which is just another downside to that. The other piece, of that that I want to point out is that the armoring can lead to what's called passive erosion. So this is this is not here, this is in Monterey at Fort Ord, but you can see um, this seawall here, once it was, sorry, this river improvement, once it was removed, the beach returned. So here, there's no beach. As sea level rises, if you harden the shoreline, then you lose the beach. Um, the natural process is that it cuts back and creates beach sand and keeps some kind of buffering beach in front of it that can provide protection to the everything behind it. So that's just the, the, the downsides of the hardening of the shoreline. And I think I'm out of time. Okay, thank you, Carla, very much. So next we have Bob Battaglio with Environmental Sciences Associates, and he is going to talk about the hazard maps and comparisons that have been done, I believe, for this area. Yes? Uh, yes. Great. Well, I changed it a little bit. Okay. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. yeah good evening. Um, maybe if I could sit and look at yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a study that we worked on for this group called the Coastal Sediment Management Work Group, which is um, the Army Corps of Engineers in the state of California. Uh, my talk has a couple of sections. I'll give a little bit of background on what the Regional Sediment Management Study is, what that means, why it was done, and then talk a little bit about physical processes. I've got a bunch of maps. I've got, I've got a map for each section of Daly City and Pacifica. I don't think we have time to go over all of them, but I, I, we might pick one and look at it. And then I'll go over some economic analysis that we did looking at the different alternatives and how they pencil out over 50 years. So first I want to have the disclaimer. Whenever we start talking about erosion and hazards, and uh, this is um, something that for our clients as well, um, you can read this later. I think we'll make this available to people. Um, so, introduction. We're not asking you to sign it, though. So, so I'm not going to sign the stamp anything. Um, I should say I am a professional civil engineer uh, with Environmental Science Associates. Um, so first, uh, the Regional Sediment Management Plan, the idea is that uh, uh, sand moves along the coast, and, and it's um, uh, segmented along our coast by headlands and these erosion-resistant outcrops. So, one way that people analyze it is to look at that little segment, or what we call a littoral cell, and kind of add up all the sand volumes, like cubic yards or whatever, cubic meters, and kind of track them and, 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 and look at it separately. And um, this image, 
This image here is from an old uh, state of California report. And each one of these little numbers is one of the littoral cells. So we were hired to look at this one up here, um, right here, 13. And to do that, uh, we looked at the shore from uh, the Golden Gate Bridge down to uh, Montero Mountain or Pedro Point, really, and so Pacifica Daily City in San Francisco. Now, the idea of regional sediment management is um, uh, some, something a lot less or a subset of coastal zone management or erosion management. It really looks, the, the idea is that if we have more sediment, then we have wider beaches, and wider beaches provide a lot of benefits, but they also prevent erosion and damages to development and property. And so to the extent that our prior activities, such as building dams or um, uh, reducing sediment delivery by pavement and all that kind of stuff, to the extent that has diminished our sediment supply, maybe we can look and find some opportunities to increase the sediment supply um, and just widen our beaches, and it's kind of a everyone's happy kind of thing. Um, and uh, then the other thing that this uh, group looks at is opportunities to find large deposits of sand and then place it on the shore to widen the beach directly, and it's a temporary activity. I'll get into that more. Oh, sorry. Um, I borrowed that from someone. Um, and so why, why do people care about beaches? And again, this is the state of California and, and the Army Corps of Engineers who hired us to look at this. Well, because uh, beaches have benefits, and we all like beaches. Um, they provide a backshore uh, uh, protection, protection to the backshore from erosion and flooding. Some people call that ecosystem services. You have a, a wide beach, you're probably not worried about losing your home, let's say. Um, uh, it also provides habitat. The beaches actually have quite a few invertebrates and, and birds nest on them and fish uh, spawn on them. So beaches are not just a place where we put our, our towels and stuff. There's actually quite a bit living in them. Um, and then, of course, people like to go to the beach and all those things. So what can be done? So now I'll talk about the alternatives. In this study, we did a lot of analysis, but we also looked at several types of alternatives. Now, there's an infinite number of alternatives, and these alternatives are intended to mitigate storm damages and coastal erosion and also try to maintain beaches. Um, the alternatives we looked at, uh, no big surprise with this group that we were working for, the sediment management group, is what we call beach nourishment. That's simply taking sand and putting it, putting it on the beach to widen the beach. And then after it erodes, you place more and you keep doing that. They do this in Miami and Virginia Beach and Ocean City and San Diego's been doing it. Um, another version is to build offshore reefs which tend to break down the waves so that the sand lasts longer. You put a lot of money in first and then the sand, you don't have to place sand quite as frequently. Um, shore armor. Now typically this group doesn't look at armoring the shore, but because Pacifica is, uh, ha has a chronic erosion problem and there's a lot of armoring, and through a public process, we looked at, well, okay, what's the baseline if you armor the whole thing or something like that? What does that look like? And um, then we had these hybrids, which are just our first cut at some mixes of these different themes. So remember one, two, three, and four. So this is a conceptual diagram that we put together to explain the idea of a range of alternatives and really scenario planning. We're considering sea level rise, we'll get into that, but, but also in terms of scenarios, you take certain actions and then those actions have consequences in terms of protecting your property or causing capital investment, uh, maintaining or losing a beach. And so we look at that into the future and we see how they work. You know, what does it look like if you take this path, that path, or the next path? So conceptually, you have up here a no action. That's like doing nothing. Uh, you'll notice that our one, two, three, and four were more towards the doing action rather than the no action because we obviously have problems. And I'm an engineer, so. Um, and then we had soft treatments, which what that, that that's the beach placing sand. It's really kind of the soft treatment. And then hard treatments, which is um, the hard armoring or the rock revetments and the sea walls. So we looked at um, uh, you know placing sand, placing sand with reefs, uh, building sea walls and revetments, and then we had this fourth hybrid category. What we're trying to do here is just within the schedule and budget and a limited uh, um, mandate or, or authority of this group, which is totally advisory, with, which is to um, kind of paint the picture so people can see what the continuum of possibilities are and then really what you all probably need to do and other than Pacifica too, is to look at all these alternatives and see if we can pick one or two and, and come together on them. And we're not done with that, I don't think, in a long shot. Anyway, so this is what beach nourishment looks like. 
Um, basically, it's often done with a hydraulic slurry. You widen the beach, and then um, so the beach is here, and then when you're done, it's out here, and, and you kind of make a mess, but then after a while, it looks good. Uh, some problems with beach nourishment is that um, you have to have the sand, and um, it's not as easy to find as you might think, and then it doesn't last, really, typically. You know, it, you place it and you have to do it again, so it's not a silver bullet solution by any means. Um, so the multi-purpose reef idea is you build a reef, like an offshore breakwater, but it's called multi-purpose because you kind of shape it so um, perhaps it's, it's uh, uh, beneficial to surfers or also fishermen and other activities. You try to get the most out of it and not just build a big structure. Um, and then the idea is that because it knocks down the waves, you get this little salient behind it where the beach is wider. Uh, this is just a schematic of what some people have designed reefs to look like. Not a lot of experience with this um, in the world. It's very expensive. Um, but anyway, we thought we'd look at it. And then there's this hybrid idea, and some of these hybrid uh, uh, alternatives that we came up with included allowing erosion to occur, which is one part of managed retreat. And I know that's very controversial. But the hybrids also included armoring and placing sand. So in a concept, everything is managed retreat now, or it's just retreat, as you've seen. Um, but um, the hybrid alternatives, which I'll get into at each reach, we looked at maybe mixing things up. Um, and by no means are the, is this exhaustive, but it's something to get you all thinking. Um, so um, how am I doing on time? Uh, ten, minutes. 10 minutes? Okay, so I'm gonna go through the coastal erosion processes really quickly. Uh, the first thing I wanna point out is that coastal erosion is not frequently mapped, and that's part of, you know, I think we're all aware of it now, but it's easy to forget. We like to forget about problems and, and stuff. But this is a FEMA map, and so this is, these are, um, let's see, so right here, are the apartments up at uh, north part of Pacifica. Two of them have been uh, removed now. And this blue line is, is the ocean. This shows um, where the 100-year flood limit is. And so if you get a mortgage, you look at that. And what's really interesting, this was put out in 2008, there's new maps coming up, but you look at this and say, oh, okay, we're fine. We've got you know, a lot of room between them. So. And um, so uh, one of the things that uh, we worked on with the Pacific Institute, we worked with, uh, with them to do this work right here, this is our work. Um, we looked at how much erosion might occur if you had no sea walls or anything. What's the potential erosion with um, 4.6 feet of sea level rise by 2100? And what we see here is that th that's where those apartments are. This erosion can reach the, the highway. So there's a big difference between those two, and I think it's important to understand that. Now this may be a little bit of an overstatement because we simplified things. It was first generation done for a statewide study but you kind of get the point. And then I think it was a little ironic that just a couple of years after we put out this report, which kind of upset a few people that we did have this uh, mild El Nino that resulted in this building being damaged. But I just think it's important to think about erosion, which we all are now with El Nino. Um, a little bit about shore face uh, morphology. So that's how the water moving shapes the land. And I'm talking about near-term morphology, not the geo geologic scale morphology. So basically we have a, a sea cliff or a dune, this is say we'd be up in Manor, except we actually have a beach here, and we have a summer and winter and things move around. And So um, the concept, I'm gonna go through this quickly. The conceptual model we have is that this junction between the beach and the bluff is an important junction. You'll notice in the winter this drops as the beach gets narrower, right? And so why is that important? So this is a, a schematic of this, uh, that prior graphic. And you'll see I've got this little line here. And this is, let's say this is the water, ocean level, and this is the, the beach, and then this is the flood. So, you know, we have a wave that comes in, and it, it breaks on the bar, and then the waves run up, right? And so the extent to which this wave hits this bluff face, and the intensity, which is kind of measured in, in how high up it goes, and the frequency is a measure of how much work is done, how much power is expended, um, and that's what we call the total water level. Conceptually, the, the extent to which that run-up or total water level hits the bluff, the more erosion we have. And so with sea level rise, you get more of that. And so when sea level rises, ex erosion accelerates. So it's not just flooding low areas, it's as sea level rises, waves get higher on the bluff and you get more, then you get erosion. 
So um, in this study with the uh, RSM that I'm talking about, we went from what was a one-line model, like the, the, just the shoreline, to what we call a two-line model. And I'll just go through this really quickly. The idea being that if you shift this, this profile seaward by, by placing sand, you can kind of mitigate the effect of sea level rise, theoretically. And so that's the ecosystem service of a wide beach that protects your back shore. Um, and so we went through a whole bunch of models with that. So anyway, um, this is um, the erosion uh, along the shore from Baker Beach in San Francisco. So here's Daly City, Muscle Rock, Manor, Beach Boulevard, Sharp Park, Hidden Cove, which is um, right by Maury Point, uh, South Maury Point, Rockaway, Lindemar, and Shelter Cove. And so what we see here, I'm sure you probably can't read this, but this is um, two feet a year of erosion, four feet a year, and this is accretion. So you see a lot of movement here, and you can see North Ocean Beach up by the Cliff House has gotten very wide. Um, but then when you get into Pacifica, you know, you're in this uh, one to two feet a year with a lot of a scatter. So our coast is eroding. And uh, this is the sea level rise uh, that we looked at um, for the, using the Army Corps of Engineers U.S. Army Corps of Engineers guidelines. So 2050, we have uh, about half a meter or a foot and a half, and then we have um, four and a half uh, feet of, of sea level rise by 2100. So I'm just gonna skip this. Well, no, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. So um, the point here also is even with the sandy shore, what happens when sea level rises, let's assume this is the shoreline, the waves act higher up on the bluff and it erodes this upper part. This part out here is part of the shore. It's actually out by the surf zone where the waves first start to break, so that could be a thousand feet offshore, right? So this is where the waves dissipate their energy. And there's certain shapes that the waves like to make. And so um, what happens when sea level rises is, is that it, conceptually this erodes and this accretes. But the key part here is that the shore moves back and the distance it moves back is proportional to this overall slope, which is 50 to 100 times, you know, conceptually how much the sea level rises. So if the sea goes up one foot, and we wait long enough and it's all erodible, the beach will go back, the shore will go back 50 feet to 100 feet. That's, that's, that's one of the, that's called the broom rule. So um, sea level rise is actually quite important to, to, to shore change. So that's my little primer. I, um, hope, sorry, that was so quick. So now what I have is a series of maps that go from Daly City. I don't have San Francisco in here. And I don't know which area you want to look at. I'll just flip through them. And what these do is they show uh, hazard maps using this two-line model through 2100 for these different alternatives. So we have you know, a map. On the map, we show where would the bluff be if we build a seawall, the whole reach, and what, what will happen if we allow erosion. So. Um, one thing about Daly City, uh, the, these bluffs are really tall, and, th and what we looked at here was the potential for a, a massive landslide or a failure. It was approximate, we looked at the geometry of prior failures, and we th figured that by 2050, or any time, we don't know when, any time, anywhere along here, you could have a, a big mass failure. And so that's this first blue block. And then over here, we have... Oh. Okay. I'm going too fast. I'm sorry. Um, so this is the ocean, and this is um, this is the golf course up at uh, what's that called? The Olympic Golf Olympic Club Golf Course. And this is Daly City. This is um, that skyline, and that what is that? Thornton Beach, right? Thornton Beach. Okay. They yeah, were just there yesterday. And so this is Daly City up here. So skyline's way high, and, the, and this is a cliff. And these are hard to see. But these cross this blue crosshatch is the limit of potential bluff top uh, uh, kind of event or catastrophic sloughing at the top. These, these, these cliffs are, in Daly City are so tall that you have erosion at the toe, which over Stevens them, but the, the ultimate flattening may happen decades or a century later. Okay. 
We're going to move just to Pacifica now because we don't have a lot of time this evening. So I am sure Bob would love to tell you about Daily City San Francisco, but for tonight we will focus on Pacifica. You know, why don't we just, if we only have three minutes, why don't I just go back to the economic results and, and, and I'm, we, we can do another thing. And... No, they want to see the picture. Show them the oh. pictures. <laughs> Do you want to look at Linda Moore? Linda Moore? Okay. Just start at the top of Pacific and walk your way down. I'll right. we'll give you a couple of extra minutes. Okay. So here's Manor. This is kind of the top of Pacific. So this is very busy, and if we had internet access, we have this interactive thing that we can do, but it, it just we don't have time. To. So anyway, um, the each of these little colored blocks is a, is a different scenario at a different time. So these four are 2050, and so the dashed ones are, are 2050. Alternative, this is option, but alternative one, two, three, and four. The first one is beach nourishment, the second one is beach nourishment with the reef, the third one is armoring, and that's the seawall everywhere. And, um, and then the fourth one is the hybrid. So what is the hybrid? The hybrid depends on the reach. So in this particular reach, you see below, we have hold the line, which is armoring, uh, or in places, you allow erosion and you place sand. This is one of the ideas we have, which may sound crazy, but if you allow or erosion occurs in certain places because you can't hold the line and, and, and you hold the line in other places, eventually you might get this kind of crenulate shore where you can place sand in between, which would be kind of like building reefs offshore, but it's a little easier, right? You just kind of, you allow some erosion and you kind of, kind of balance that. So that's the hybrid. So we would protect, hold the line in some places and have a little beach access in other places. So, and if you ever want to look at this, the way you tell which one is which is the dark bar along here um, was where we assumed that we would hold the line. And then the light bar is where we assume for some reason that it, it when there's many ways you could look at that. So um, what this shows is that uh, if you, if, let's look at armoring, which is everyone's favorite. So um, the green is the armoring, and what we show here is even if you try to hold the line all the way along here, we figure that the top of the bluff will come back, and the waves will, you know, with sea level rise and everything, you'll get so much run up and, and et cetera, and then terrestrial erosion, as we were talking about at the top, that it will have to flatten out. And so we figure that, you know, roughly, even if you do that, you'd get the bluff top would be back here on the uh, east side of. Uh, uh, what is that? Uh, Palmetto, right? Palmetto, Esplanade, Palmetto. Uh, anyway, that coast road. And here's the, well, I don't want to say who's work. But anyway, um, and then if we look at the hybrid where we allow some erosion and in some places you get a slightly different uh, setup and, um, and that's the, uh, the kind of red line. And so what happens, it's hard to see, but the red line is by the green line here, and it jumps over to the yellow line uh, where we, we, uh, we don't have um, the seawall. Anyway, it's a lot easier if you can look at this interactively. Um, just one second. Yes. So just for reference, I'm giving Bob a moment to pause. Okay. On the back of your agendas, everybody flip it around, you will see websites. All of these map references are there for you to look at in more detail. And um, all of these presentations will be posted on the Friends of Pacifica's Environmental Family uh, website. So this, this is not your last chance to look at it, it's just the point. Yeah, and we can do this again and maybe take more time with it. Um, so, because you know this is obviously very important, I think people want to get into this. And, and again, these are just four of, of, of the infinite number of options. And, but I think this is the process that I would encourage the city to go through and try to come together or something and get some outside money to you know, help us do it, right? Um, so this is Beach Boulevard. And uh, Beach Boulevard, we also looked at um, armoring, which is uh, hold the line or, or armoring and, uh, I mean, seawalls and stuff. And here's the pier. And let's see, this would be uh, Paloma, Beach Boulevard, Clarendon's here. Um, Anyway, so uh, let's see here. With the armoring, we figured that even with armoring, uh, as sea level rose, we, we showed the hazard line going in basically to the, um, the land side or the east side of Beach Boulevard just because the wave overtopping would be so significant. Now we didn't 
look at the option of raising the wall another 10 feet or something, but we just kind of showed that even if you hold that armored position, you know, with four or five feet of sea level rise, there's going to be a lot of water coming over the top. So uh, as an engineer, I have to say that, you know, there's still a hazard there. Whether or not the, the homes could uh, survive that is another matter uh, for more detailed analysis. And then farther up here, we looked at these structures north of the Beach Boulevard seawall we, uh, as not being quite as significant. And I don't mean to diminish anyone's armoring, but at Beach Boulevard, it's a state-funded uh, entity, so we thought, well, maybe the city might more likely uh, maintain that. It's been designed. Some of this, um, we weren't quite as sure. You could look at it different ways, but we show greater hazards uh, and the loss of those homes. Uh, it's just uh, my best guess at it. Uh, if we go down to uh, uh, Shark Park, where the golf course is, and uh, Maury Point, this beautiful uh, National Park walkway. I don't know if, how many people like to walk out on that boardwalk. Isn't it great? It's fantastic. Um, so we looked again at uh, beach nourishment, and the beach nourishment, what the beach nourishment does, these yellow and orange, is what, they, what it does is it, it kind of keeps the, the shore out a little bit, and we get less back shore damages, but you have to put a lot of money into it. In this location, that looks potentially uh, beneficial. This is a positive there, because we already have a beach and there's not big home, you know, homes right behind it. Um, but we also looked at hold the line, which is something that a lot of people have talked about as the green. And with that, we would expect you would lose the beach. And I think it would, it would, it would take some work to maintain that armoring there. It's not a small activity. Um, and that comes out in our economic analysis. If you allow erosion to occur, by 2050, we figure that the back of the beach would be back here, which is landward of, the, um, of where the levee is now. And then by 2100, with this, this is high sea level rise, uh, the um, back part of the beach would be back here, but this would be beach still. So when we look at the economics of that, we thought, okay, well, we're, we're having these adverse impacts and, um, and, and loss of this uh, levee walkway, which is actually probably the biggest amenity in this area. Uh, from the, according to the economists. I didn't do that analysis, the economists did. But this, uh, this walkway, I think, has a really high value. Um, so you'd lose that, but you'd maintain a beach. So anyway, when you look at the economics, those are all the things that are rolled into that, um, that analysis. Um, so this is Rockaway. Um, Rockaway, we looked at beach nourishment. One of the nice things is that we have these two headlands here. So it's kind of like our reefs. And so the, maybe the sand would last longer, although there's strong rip currents there, obviously. But the beach used to be wider. So um, if we look at the uh, beach nourishment, which is the yellow, we think we can maintain, with a fair amount of beach nourishment, we can maintain the hazard zone to this limit. And then we assume that this coastal armoring would be maintained and there'd be some overtopping. So conceptually, these hazards would still exist, but we're assuming that there is, this would be maintained. And, and maybe it will, maybe it won't. Um, but that this would not be armored and we would use sand placement to, to limit how much erosion we got. So that was one. The other alternative was just to um, uh, hold the line at, at this armoring, maintain this, and then everywhere else just allow erosion, so allow this to erode. And what we found is by 2100, you know, we're getting kind of close to the road. Um, you know, you're cutting through the, the parking lot here. So beach nourishment may be worth looking at at that location in terms of uh, the economic payback. Um, here in Lindemar, we uh, looked at beach nourishment and no action, and, and that's because uh, this beach is already pretty wide. And most of our decision process in this study was focused on the 2050, year 2050 time horizon. You know, a lot of the times you do one thing to get through 2050, and then if sea level really accelerates, we might have to take a, net, a different path by 2100. So we did the mapping, but the economics, I should say, is only to 2050. So that's um, part of why we didn't perhaps look at some other options here. But again, the yellow is um, placing sand to repeatedly to buffer this. And what we do is we figure out, well, as the level rises and the shore starts to recede faster and faster, we place sand more frequently. To, to maintain a performance standard is the way we model it. There's different ways of doing it. But if we allow erosion by 2050, you are starting to get um, into the highway here past the surfer's parking lot. And by 2100, you know, theoretically, candidly, we didn't consider 
all the sewer lines and the armoring and everything else. So that's it's a potential. It's not a true prediction. That's in the disclaimer at the front. So that's okay. So you don't want to look at the economics. I have. I, I have we have a limited time okay, tonight. Bye. Thank you, Bob, very much. See if you can get Margaret to organize another evening so you can talk economics with Bob. Okay, uh, next we are going to hear from Joshua Cons Cosgrove um, from um, Infrastructure in Pacifica. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much. All right, so thank you very much. Um, I just want to thank the uh, event organizers uh, for allowing me to come and, and speak here tonight. And, it's been great listening to the other speakers, and, and I think this is a really, really great discussion about you know what uh, what sea level rise means to our community, and I, I'm here just to kind of talk in a little bit of specifics about the infrastructure, uh, most specifically the wastewater infrastructure in Pacifica. So a little bit about me: I worked for 20 plus years for the city of Pacifica here in the wastewater department, so I was on the front lines, if you will, of managing wastewater assets. Um, wait, uh, managing our community's wastewater infrastructure um, with living right next to the Pacific Ocean, you know, dealing with major storms and things like that. So some of you I'm sure here probably live in Lower Lindemar and when you've seen a lot of the flooding going on here and you're like, why hasn't someone turned on that pump? I'm the, I'm the guy that's turning on the pump and trying to get it pumped out. So that, that's what I had been doing for 20 plus years. This last year I, I got hired with the city of Daly City, so I work in their water wastewater department now. Um, so I'm gonna go through fairly quickly the high risk areas of Pacifica's infrastructure here to sea level rise. So let me start with our pump stations, specifically here in Lindemar, our pump stations. We have two, um, we have one raw wastewater pump station that is also a combined stormwater station. We call that Lindemar. It's the station that's just south of Taco Bell uh, here at the beach. And then we also have Anza pump station, which is the station that's just north of Taco Bell. That is a stormwater station. So the Lindemar pump station is the largest wastewater pump station in Pacifica. Pumps about a million gallons a day up and over the hill to the Clare Creek water recycling plant. It is right next to the ocean. Okay. One of the things that Pacifica has done uh, in the last 20 years, we've been very proactive in trying to mitigate um, managing infrastructure next to the ocean. At the Linamar pump station, we have taken all the electrical components and raised it up above the flood zone in there so that if there was a flood, at least the electrical components would be above that. Um, the flood control project for the uh, San Pedro Creek, very important to protecting this lower Lindemar area um, during uh, heavy rainfall. Uh, all that has been done over the last 20 plus years. One of the things I remember in some of the big uh, flood events in this lower Lindemar area, what used to happen was San Pedro Creek, when you'd have heavy rain and you had the high tides come in and the creek couldn't get out into the ocean, you would actually have the creek flow back through the storm drain system into the uh, lower Lindemar area here and, and just exacerbate the flooding. And what we did uh, over the last 20 years, this is about a, a little over a decade ago, is we actually um, they expanded the, the flood control of the flood area, the flood plain of the creek, and they put one-way valves on all of the storm drain outfalls that go to the creek. So when it does back up, it doesn't come back into the lower Lindemar area. But um, despite all that, what you have is you have two stations that have to pump out this whole lower Lindemar area, which, as many of you probably know, used to be a lake. You've got all these hillsides that are draining down into here. That's a lot of storm rain. You're talking about uh, thousands of gallons per minute during significant rain events that needs to be pumped out of this lower area into the, the ocean. And um, as, a, as a person that's working in that, that that's trying to manage the, those, uh, those pumps and motors during that time, it's very, very difficult. Um, you are running everything to its max. And any little mistake that happens, um, it's like that, and you have you have catastrophic flooding. So it's very very difficult to manage um, our our stations here 
at, uh, at sea level and in this area. And the, the individuals, the, the person that you have working, the persons that you have working there, extremely dedicated to, uh, to you know, assuring that the, the safety and, and getting the water that comes in there out as fast as possible to the ocean. But it is a very, very difficult job. Um, the, uh, the sanitary sewer system here, one thing I want to point out uh, is Pedro Point. There is one pipeline that runs from Pedro Point underneath San Pedro Creek to the Lindemar pump station over there. It's, um, it's fairly deep. It's got to go under the creek. It's um, ductile iron pipe and also plastic pipe, very thick, but it's an it's, uh, uh, area, uh, uh, infrastructure at high risk, being right there next to the ocean, and you lose that, you cut off um, Pedro Point. So something that, that definitely is concerns, um, has concerned the city of Pacific over the years, trying to protect that. Um, but just, just at a basic level, Lindemar, it's, it's just a lot of operation that goes into um, pumping out the wastewater that, that comes through Lower Lindemar and pumping out the, the rainwater that comes into here. So let me move on um, to Rockaway. There's a small station right there next to the ocean in Rockaway. Pumps out flow that comes from Valleymar and from the Rockaway neighborhood. About 200,000 gallons of raw wastewater a day. It's right there at the, uh, right there at the ocean level. Uh, we do have the seawall and the, the riprap there in Rockaway, so it's, it's fairly protected, but it's another uh, high-risk asset right there. Um, let me move to Sharp Park. Uh, we have two pump stations in Sharp Park, a small one called the Brighton Pump Station, the intersection of Brighton and Palmetto. Pumps probably 100 to 200,000 gallons a day. Flow coming from Fairway and Southern Sharp Park. And it's a small station that just pumps it just to a larger station, the Sharp Park Station, which is where the old treatment plant was, um, just next to the pier. Uh, that station, the Brighton Station at the intersection, um, many of you have seen the intersection of Clarendon and Lakeside. Uh, the city has to put out portable pumps to pump that area when you have significant rain. Well, that wastewater station, the water comes right up to the, uh, to the door on that station, and, and again, it's something that's very high risk that is, is really difficult for the city to manage, um, and, but it, and it's right there, high, high, very high risk. And then let me move to uh, Sharp Park Pump Station. Again, it's at the old treatment plant site. About a million gallons of raw wastewater is pumped from there to the Clara Creek Water Recycling Plant in Valleymar, right next to the pier, uh, protected by the seawall, and, and it's reliant on the seawall. <clears throat> so um, when, you know, go back 30, 30 plus years before, uh, before I was working for this city and before there was a seawall, the ocean, even back then, would come right up into the treatment plant. I, I used to hear stories about how, you know, water would just knock over the front gate of the treatment plant over there when you had high tides and things like that. And now it's, it's that whole area, even though the treatment plant is gone, you still have a pump station right there, and you know you're dealing with um, with uh, still the same kind of uh, exacerbation with sea level rise in that area. Um, so those are the those are the major um, pump stations of Pacifica. One good thing you know I can mention is our wastewater treatment plant, the Clare Creek Water Recycling Plant, is in Valleymar and it's uh, at a high level, and it's it's really away from any kind of the. Um, uh, sea level rise issues that we're talking about here today. So that, that's a very good thing. That's, that is probably one of the most um, uh, valuable assets of Pacifica, about you know, 50, 60 million dollars worth of equipment and, and structures there. And it's, it's pretty well protected from sea level rise. So that, that's a, a very good thing. So a, a few more uh, high risk um, pieces of infrastructure in the wastewater system. There's a force main Wastewater force main. So Lindemar over here pumps raw wastewater through a force main that runs on the west side of Highway 1. So it's at risk from um, uh, some of the, the maps that you saw from sea level rise and from erosion from that, things like that. Um, and it, it runs west side of Highway 1 over the hill into Rockway again still on the west side. So um, again, million gallons or so of raw wastewater flow through that every day. And um, it, it's right there next to the ocean. And then if you go to Sharp Park Pump Station, the force main from that station 
uh, runs out of that station onto Beach Boulevard. And so again, that's relying on the, upon the seawall and the protection that the seawall gives it to that uh, pipeline. And again, about a million gallons of raw wastewater that are flowing through that pipeline also to the Clare Creek Water Recycling Plant. And, um, and so all this is very, very, very difficult to manage, um, but, uh, but the city does, a, does its best job to try to do that. Um, So the sanitary sewer system, the wastewater collection system, um, there's some vulnerable parts to that, obviously here in Lower Lindemar. Uh, the city has been doing a lot of upgrades to the sanitary sewer system here, but still it's at high risk from the floods that occur here. Along Esplanade, uh, Palmetto, some of those areas there's been heavy erosion, there's a sanitary sewer system, there's water lines that, that run through there that are at risk. Beach Boulevard, um, again, there's utilities that are in the promenade of Beach Boulevard. Um, the uh, the seawall breach that just happened um, just this last winter season, um, the sewer line was actually exposed going through uh, going through the promenade there. And um, so these are these are again assets that you know you've got thousands of gallons of raw wastewater flowing through there that um, that we need to protect. And another thing to mention is the city um, is under a cease and desist order and consent decree by the state. So any 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 spills that happen, we're under high scrutiny when those happen. So um, we're uh, subject not just to the public health concern of raw wastewater spills, we're also subject to fines as well from the state um, when that happens. Um, that's sort of a high, high level look at the wastewater system. The water system doesn't, I don't need to focus too much on that. There are some assets at risk, uh, mostly water pipelines. But really, the wastewater system is uh, where your highest highest risk areas are, and uh, you know I'll ha be happy to answer any questions that anyone may have later on. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Okay, we're going to come here from Hillary one more time, and then we're going to go through the questions. So we're almost done. Thanks for being so great, everybody. Great. Thank you, Joshua. That was very interesting. Um, so now, um, we'll just give up the slides here. I'm going to talk a little bit about our vulnerability assessment that the county is um, undergoing right now. Um, I guess before I start, I should thank TJ Carter, our Climate Corps fellow here. He's been instrumental in working on our vulnerability assessment. Um, and we're working with the Climate Change Tech Community Task Force as well, and Margaret Goodale and Stan um, Sensen, Sue Degree. Any others here from our, um, oh, and um, Celeste as well. Um, so uh, we've, we've convened a number of different stakeholder groups to help us with our um, development of the vulnerability assessment, a technical working group, uh, policy advisory committee, and then um, the community task force as well. Yeah. You might just want to say what is the vulnerability assessment. Yeah. 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 I, um, so um, but I will, um, I don't really need the slides. Um, so I just, um, give you a little bit of background. The, the county received grant funds from the Coastal Conservancy to conduct our vulnerability assessment and we started last June. So um, what is a vulnerability assessment and why would we want to conduct one? Um, so a vulnerability assessment is the process of understanding what in the county is at risk from, uh, we're looking at flooding and erosion and, and then future sea level rise. So flooding today and our, um, and then future scenarios of different amounts of, of sea level rise. Um, so why have we embarked on this process? So as I mentioned before, the county is one of the most vulnerable counties in the state, and now we know in the nation in terms of uh, number of people that are at risk. A vulnerability assessment is really a study to understand what what different you know things assets um, could be exposed to, um, to different amounts of sea level rise. Um, so if vulnerability means is, is something exposed is it an area that could be affected by erosion by waters from, from flooding. Is it sensitive? So if it is affected, is it a problem? Is it gonna is it gonna shut down a wastewater treatment plant? And then what's its adaptive capacity? So for instance, the, the, the pump station that Joshua mentioned, they elevated the electricity. 
So it's exposed, it could get wet, um, it's sensitive, like it could have, a, have a, a problem, but they were able to, you know, the adaptive capacity was a very, you know, it can still essentially function because the electricity is elevated to, so to a point. Um, so, I, I, um, so if we go, let's see, the, um, oh, I thought you, uh, so here's the, we kicked out the vulnerability assessment in June. Um, there's a number of steps. This is really the first part of a multi-phase process to under, um, taking action to prepare the county for sea level rise. Uh, so the, the first thing we did is um, convene your stakeholder groups and then we worked to gather a lot of GIS data for um, all the different assets that we care about in the, in the um, county. So that's been built assets, natural assets, community assets, and then we've overlaid them with sea level rise maps and then now we're working to understand you know, what, what is some of the risk from, from where things are located. So it, after we gathered all the different assets, we've divided them up into categories, and um, we use categories that BCDC developed in their adapting to rising tides <coughs> process. And then um, we're working with Arcadis Consulting to do the technical part of the study, and they have taken the, the built assets of, of the that we've gathered and have classified them in terms of, so if, if this asset were to fail and couldn't work, would there be a risk to human life and safety? And they've given those assets a category of one, and then other assets, assets that we still care about, if there's not a risk to human life and safety, they've given them a one. And, and so they've color-coded them on a map, and then we can get a sense for, are there clumps of assets that if they failed, that would have an impact to human life and safety? Just to get a sense of where things are, and are there, um, cumulative impacts of vulnerability. Um, so here, th this shows that we're looking at social vulnerability, ecosystem vulnerability, as well as um, the, built, the built environment vulnerability. So here's some of the draft maps that um, we've completed. This shows that um, the big yellow band is the future erosion zone that we have gathered from the uh, PWASA data that was put together in the Pacific Institute. And then we've used the Art Coast Our Future tool to, um, to show where different future scenarios could be. So we have a, the, the flood today, because we want to know if there was a big storm today, what would be at risk? And then we added three feet and then six feet as well. And then on the, this on the, on the bay side, um, they show our scenarios. And so our, our, we, were only, we were limited to three scenarios, but the, the Arc Poster Future tool, you're able to look at one foot increments. So we'll be able to dive down in a deeper level and see incrementally, um, you know, when things get wet. So um, on to, to that effect, on the bay side, we are also working with AECOM to come up with another set of maps that show us the, in the areas where levees could become overtopped. So these these maps are at a little bit of a finer scale than the Arc Coaster Future maps, and they use um, the um, the, sh the shoreline data that was collected through FEMA. Um, so some, some of the levees are, are captured a little bit more accurately. And so this, this is a bunch of pretty colors that essentially shows um, where the low points are and where water could start, um, where the inundation pathways are, essentially. So, uh, so far in this process, we have done the exposure analysis, so we have you know, here, here's where the assets are located and here's where they're, um, which are in sea level rise zones and which are out of the sea level rise zones. And we've compiled these by the, the categories and the classes for each of the cities. And then these are the unincorporated areas because we're focusing on what's at risk from county unincorporated areas as well. And then, so there's thousands of those assets. And so what we're doing as part of the study is picking uh, 30 case study assets. And the, the goal for these assets is for, to be to find representative assets. So we can't look at everything, and, and we're not necessarily looking at the 30 most vulnerable assets. We want to find um, different uh, representative assets across the geographic areas of the county and then different types of assets. So we have wastewater treatment plants, a hospital, we have uh, sections of transport, the, the highways and public transportation, as well as community centers and an actual community to look at social vulnerability. And the goal is to understand, use these as templates and to fill out the rest of the, um, the assets for the county in, in coordination with our stakeholders. So we're, we're in the, uh, the midst of doing asset interviews and site visits and should have the, the case studies written up by um, in the next couple months. 
So, um, as I mentioned, we're working with um, stakeholder groups, and um, and this really is the first phase of the process. This is, I guess, we're, we're learning here. You know, as soon as you start working, the more you realize you don't know. And so, I feel like we're just kind of compiling, you know, a list of the things that that will be really important to incorporate as part of our next next phases. And then we really do want to. You can also study and study and study and study. So we're also, I think, we know enough to really start to be able to take action as well. Um, so. Next step. <laughs> All right, so we are a little beyond where we hope to be for questions, um, but let me another public service announcement. So if we don't get all, if we don't get through all the questions tonight, we group them into sets to go through in the next 15 minutes. Um, they will be posted on Pacifica's environmental website. So questions will be up there, and I'm assuming we'll do some attempts to answer them as well. Any other questions you want to hand in? OK, so for our panelists, this is the your turn to answer. So Bob, this one is for you, specifically. Um, um, and it said, can we continue to plan our new library on Palmato, Palmetto with no fear about flooding and erosion and causing damage and destruction? Not only was there that question, but there was another one that was talking about the hotel. Um, and so there was also some concern about a hotel that is also along the shoreline. Same site. Okay. So I would say that as an engineer, the um, development would need to consider uh, these hazards and design for them and also consider future uh, hazards. Obviously, um, there'll be a need for a coastal development permit from the Coastal Commission and their guidance is pretty clear about considering sea level rise. The, the, to get more specific, my judgment would be that you know if the buildings are elevated on pilings, um, you could probably design them to uh, uh, for the 2050 conditions. Once you get past 2050 there, I think it would probably work. I think you'd want to look at it because uh, four and a half feet, five feet of sea level rise is really like a whole other tide level. So I think we just want to be careful. And I know it's hard to envision that, but that's what, that's what we're charged with looking at. So. Uh, I would say over the short term, if they're elevated on pilings, they could conform with the flood insurance program, FEMA's program, and the city could stay in compliance. Um, maybe park underneath them. The Lighthouse Hotel is kind of set up like this. We have parking underneath. So I think it's potentially possible. Like stilts? Yes. Yeah, like stilts. But what they would be is, um, you know, reinforced concrete pilings that, that go way uh, deeply or deeply founded so that the um, first uh, floor that's a living dwelling floor would be above the elevation of waves uh, rushing up over the land. And so the water would go underneath it during a 100-year event, let's say. And then under m most conditions, let's say, that wouldn't happen. That's allowed by FEMA, and it's, uh, you can still get insurance as long as it's designed correctly. Yeah. Okay, don't leave yet. So there's another very specific question, which is, what about flooding on Fairway West, Maury Point, homes of homes if the levees erode away and when? Any comments on that? Yeah. And then I'll let you. Yeah, you know, we did another study for um, a couple of environmental groups, and uh, we looked at uh, a restoration alternative for the golf course, uh, which also the city of San, uh, San Francisco did. So we were just trying to help them out. But um, in that study, there is a, uh, a, a levy plan that has the levy set back um, at Fairway Park and at the Clarendon Road area. If you um, walk out on that boardwalk, you know you can walk behind Fairway Park there. So it turns out you only need a levy about this high uh, there uh, to pr protect that housing area. That was our first cut at it anyway because um, with the golf course or wetlands or whatever and the beach, the waves will be diminished significantly. Um, this is the same philosophy they're using in San Francisco Bay. So use the wetlands to protect the back shore, put the levees as far back as possible. They're cheaper, they're more resilient. A levee on a sand beach is 
difficult. So just so we're clear on that. Um, but so we do have a we did look at that and it looked to us feasible if you built a small levy um, along the back shore uh, and you would need probably two pump stations because the stormwater would uh, not be able to get out during the flood events. Great. Okay. Next question. You get to sit down. No, 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 we don't have time, Bob. We're gonna we're gonna stick to the questions that were answered or asked. Okay, so Carla, this is going to test your geologic knowledge. Here you go. And question number one: Is the rock the same at Moray Point as it is along Esplanade? And Esplanade, I believe, is the bluffs. Um, no. Do you want to speak into the mic a little? If that mic will work. You just have to do so. No is the answer. Um, the rock at Lori Point is the Franciscan formation that I was talking about. At least, at least part of it is, um, and that was one of those little green blobs that was sticking out on the geologic map. Um, so that's all old oceanic crust. That some of it is greenstone, which is a um, metamorphic rock, and so some of it is chert, which is sedimentary. But it's all much more solid than the stuff at Esplanade. Okay, here's your next geology quick quiz. Put the professor on the spot. Okay, so this is about the age of the rock strata that is in the road, or under the road, and now walkable. So do you have any idea how old that rock strata may be? Um, what road? <laughs> One that is now walkable. Anyone in the audience? Someone wrote this. Yeah. Which road? Which road? Devil Fly? Yeah. Oh, Devil Fly. Any ideas? I don't know. Okay, we'll have to look that one I up. Can, if somebody one emails me, I can I can look at the geologic map and tell you, but I don't know off the top of my head. It's also older, I can tell you that much. Okay, this one may be for Joshua, I'm guessing. I don't know if you're gonna know the answer to this one or not, but we will see. How will sea level rise affect the water table and the, the, the vegetation that depends on fresh water? Have you looked into the water table, Joshua? Um, well, not specifically, no, I have not. Uh, I know that sea level rise will affect, you know, uh, the groundwater table through saltwater intrusion. I'm sure Bob could probably answer that a lot better than I could. I know the water district, I'm on the board of directors for the North Coast County Water District, and one of the, one of the uh, water sources, water supply sources we are looking at is our groundwater uh, sources. Unfortunately, we are so, because we are so close to the ocean, it's very high in salt content and very expensive to treat and produce. Um, so that is certainly an issue on, on things that um, that we would look at as far as future projects. But we, we are we are looking at ways to deal with that also. We have a source of recycled water now in Pacifica, and you could potentially use recycled water to push back against the ocean water. So there, there are some, some interesting ideas that we are looking at. Um, but I believe sea level rise is definitely going to exacerbate, you know, saltwater intrusion into groundwater for sure. Okay, does anybody else want to add quickly to that? We'll move on to another question. This is another one related to water. Um, and so um, a couple of people may be able to answer that, this question. Was there more natural drainage? And I think we heard that there definitely was, someone talked about a part of the, the area being a lake. Natural drainage, streams, etc. prior to development in the area with the houses, etc. Was there less erosion on top of these bluffs? Or put another way, does the development impact the way the bluffs get saturated? Or is there a way to improve the drainage so that the bluffs get less saturated? How's that for a multi-question question? question. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the development definitely has had an effect. I haven't studied that specifically. We started to get into it, but it was um, beyond our scope of the study we looked at. But um, the pavement does a couple things. It uh, causes water to run off more quickly and uh, concentrate, and uh, then you have to carry it through to the, the beach and pipes. Um, and if it gets loose anywhere, of course, it can raise uh, havoc. The other thing that the pavement does is um, it prevents um, sediment yield from the from the watershed from the runoff. So I think that I, I would expect that the, the net effect of all the development in Pacifica and the um, uh, uh, placement of a lot of the runoff in the pipes uh, is to reduce the sediment supply and that's probably detrimental to, uh, to our beaches. Okay, 
Next question, Bob, hang on to that mic. Um, this is a twofer um, because they are the yin and yang of sand and beach nourishment. So one question, hang on to your hats, people, is does beach nourishment, in other words, adding sand affect wildlife habitat? Someone might want to take that one on. But then there's another question very much related to beach nourishment, which I'm going to throw out there at the same time, which is, why has there been no mention of the city of San Francisco? It wasn't the city of San Francisco, but it was the state renewing long-term contracts with two companies to dredge massive amounts of sand just inside the Golden Gate. Isn't this hurting Pacifica? So on the one hand, you have someone who wants to know about beach nourishment, whether or not it affects habitat, and how long it lasts. And the other wants to know about the big sand mine that goes into San Francisco Bay and how it affects it. Why do I say the in and Yag? Because if you beach nourish with something, you have to get it from somewhere. Bob. Carla. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start off because, um, um, so, uh, beach nourishment does have adverse effects during construction, and if you do it, and, and, but theoretically, uh, or scientifically, the um, invertebrates that live in the beach in the rack uh, that, that washes up onto the beach organic matter, and then the insect population, etc., will recover. Um, so there is a, an initial impact that is uh, short-lived. If you nourish or disturb the area very frequently, then um, you really don't realize the ecological benefit. So there's a, there's a real uh, question and there is a debate about whether beach nourishment is beneficial to the environment or ecology or not. And I think it, as far as I know, and this is the latest science that I've seen, is that it's okay, you have an impact there is an improvement because you do provide habitat. If you disturb the beach too frequently, you have to place sand too frequently, you basically degrade the environment and it's really just for people at that point. Um, in terms of sand mining, um, I would expect that the sand mining in central San Francisco Bay will probably, I would guess, probably stop or slow significantly at some point after everyone looks at it some because uh, the science indicates that the central bay shoals are part of the littoral cell. We stopped at the Golden Gate, but actually the tides and everything extends into the bay. And I've, I've got a paper on this, if somebody wants to look at it. Um, and there's a lot of other papers by the USGS, etc. So I think this is something that hap that's happened over a long time frame. Um, there's sand mining in Monterey Bay that the Coastal Commission now just voted to stop, uh, which is a big problem. And so. What you, what, I mean, it's good that the Coast Commission uh, voted to stop it, but um, uh, anyway, th this is a legacy issue where the best sand is the sand on the beach or in the shoals that the, the waves or the currents have sorted. And this coarse sand is very valuable for all kinds of things, uh, concrete, filters, uh, sand blasting. And um, so we bought this stuff and used it without recognizing the adverse effects. There are some sand mining that happens up in the Pacific Northwest where you have glacial deposits that are well inland and you have these pits and, and this happens in other places that perhaps that's not quite as bad. Um, one of the big problems about beach nourishment in Pacifica that we came up with in our study is we actually couldn't find a source of sand that was coarse enough at the volumes and rates that we needed to um, achieve our, our alternatives. Um, without going up to San Francisco. And that there's a lot of problems with that. There's a lot of problems with that. Um, I will say also that there's not enough information to know for sure what the grain sizes are and how thick the deposits are and, and exactly, there may be places to get the coarser uh, sand that we would like at Pacifica, so. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go back to Joshua, this is a tough one. Um, so what is the date, <clears throat> off the top of your head, that the state has told the city it can no longer have any capacity related to sewage discharges? And what is the projected completion date for the Equalization Basin Project? <clears throat> okay, so I, I went to, I believe I said this, gosh, I sure hope I did. I don't work for the city of Basilia anymore <laughs> in the wastewater department. I work for the city of Daly City in the water wastewater department. Um, so, the, uh, the date that the city can no longer have capacity related overflows, you know what, I, I'm not gonna answer that one. You, someone, someone contact the city and ask them. I, I'm not gonna say that off the top of my head. I know it's sooner rather than later, uh, but contact the city please. And then uh, the next question, 
which was equalization basin again okay contact the city look at their website um they need to build it sooner rather than later again it's uh i know it's in the design stage but it's very close to being completed so um i see somebody here from the city i'm looking at them right now so if you want to capture that that tall individual sitting right there named christian yeah we'll pass the information yes. on to the city because we're going to try to stay focused on the questions we have so for sake of those who are getting tired and wanting to go home we have three more questions we will probably keep these three questions. We will have them answer them because it'll probably take us just a few minutes. If you need to leave, of course, you're welcome to do that. Please take care of yourself on that regard. And as we close tonight, if you would be so kind as to help us stack the chairs, that would be helpful. But don't do it until they're done talking. Okay, so the next one um, is probably, um, okay, this is how will sea level rise impact the development in the quarry and is sea level rise taken into account in the de in the development plans of that quarry? And I don't know who would know the answer to that question, if anybody. Anyone? Nope. Okay, so that one we cannot answer, but that will be passed along to the city. Um, the second, second to last is sea walls and hard armoring can lead to more beach erosion. What are the good alternatives for Lindemar Beach in a 60 year time frame? And I guess, Bob, that's probably a good one for you given that you looked at some alternatives to Armarine. Well, many of you probably know that one of the national examples of managed retreat was implemented at Lindemar, um, what, 10 or 15 years ago. And I, I had the uh, benefit of working on that with um, um, Scott Holmes, who's the city and others um, that were here. Uh, and the city council and etc. So uh, it works. It's with, it's been great, I think, for uh, Linda Moore. And um, it's amazing what will happen if you just step back a little bit and let the waves dissipate their energy. Um, all of a sudden, the city didn't have to ask FEMA for money to place rocks to protect the, the, um, the parking lot anymore. So uh, but when you out there and, and park there and look at it, imagine uh, that we've moved it back uh, about 60 feet. And uh, it's been great for 10 or 15 years since going through the storms pretty well. So I think um, managed retreat has its place. Uh, it's, it's almost a no-brainer in places where you have a lot of public property and, um, and you have some space. When you have private property, of course, that's, that's, a, that's a big challenge. Um, so I think uh, we should look at the continuing that in Lindemar. And I think that uh, either opportunistically finding sand such as when you're excavating for a sewer facility or something like that, and you generate sand and you need to truck it somewhere. Ideally, you can put it on the beach and that will help um, if it's the right size sand. And then uh, a more um, direct nourishment to, uh, or a larger volume placement of sand could also be part of this managed retreat philosophy. Managed retreat is not just walking away, it's actually figuring out what tools to use so that you can maintain the, um, uh, the natural morphology so that you let nature do your work for you and you can enjoy that. Um, so I, I don't know if I answered the question, but I'd say Lindemar is an excellent place to look at, at retreat. Okay, and then this last one is actually kind of a cluster of questions. So, and, and the first one I think is really directed at the group, not at the panel, but the panel, if the panel on the panel wants to try to take this one on, that you're welcome. But I think this is actually a fairly good closing thing to think about, remembering that we are a community, that we have people who are vulnerable, that we love the ocean, and we just learned an awful lot about what's going on in this area. Um, and so the one question is, does it make sense to use our resources trying to keep the ocean back wouldn't it be better to rethink the previous plan for Pacifica to include the inevitable changes occurring in our geographical region, or with our geology, I'm not sure which they meant. Um, and then um, there is a question here also about, um, is there movement towards sustainable cities? If anyone on the panel is familiar with sustainable cities, I know there is a sustainable communities effort in San Francisco Bay going on. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to take on either of those, um, but I think those are actually very good reflective questions for the group, more so for the panel, because this is your community. Some of these folks do live in your community and are great resources for you. Some of them work in your community. 
Um, but I'm gonna turn it over to Hillary. Yeah, I can, I can just, um, I guess make a comment on that. So I think one of the reasons why my position was created at the county, so my title is the Climate Resiliency Specialist, is because of the, the need for this kind of thinking about how do we, how do we prepare for a community that, that benefits all of us and is, you know, some, somewhere where it includes uh, protecting the things we love and, and you know, all of, uh, it is, you know, safe and healthy and prosperous, takes, you know, thinking ahead because the past is not the future anymore. We have to incorporate climate change and, and incorporate all of the different things that are changing. And so I think a lot of the current erosion right now definitely is making everyone aware that we, that we don't want to be reactive, we want to be thinking ahead in terms of uh, what the future looks like. And I think there's a number of different ways to do that. And, you know, there's different tools that are available in terms like policy, um, land use plans and LCPs for the Coastal Commission is one way to show where do we want development to be and, and what, what do we want to protect and, and so forth. And then in terms of capital planning, the, where the city decides to make investments, that's another another way to do it, as well as community forums right here and really having your voice um, go to the um, to to our city government. So. Okay. so I believe that is it. I want to once again thank Margaret for putting this together. Thank our lovely ladies here who are furiously reading questions, sorting them, trying to figure out what was the same and what was different. And very much our panelists who spent their evening with us. Thank you. And one more, I didn't want to forget everybody who came and contributed tonight. Thank you all very much. If you want to help with the chairs, if you can just stack them, if you can stack the chairs like five,